So we're going to go from verse 18 uh, through to verse 25. Verse 18 through to 25 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth and he says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. These are the words of our living God to us this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we, as we come to hear your word and to, to look at your words today, I pray that you would do a work in our hearts, that you would help us to focus on this message that the world considers foolish, yet at the same time is the power of God for salvation to those who believe. So, so Father, we ask you this morning that you would help um, us as we, as we study your word, help all of us to hear and also to do, to, to obey, not just, not just to be hearers, and I pray, Lord, that you would help me to be faithful to the preaching of your text this morning, making known the scriptures today, that we would receive loving insight and challenge where we need challenge, that we would receive, receive encouragement where we need encouragement this morning. And most of all, Lord, that we would be reminded of the great salvation that is given to us in Christ at the cross. We pray this together in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this, uh, this section of scripture, Paul is is writing this letter to the church in Corinth. And uh, we've been through some of Paul's letters before. We're currently going through his letter that he writes to Rome, to the Romans, to the church there. The church that he writes to in Corinth is a church that is, is known by, by many, as you study the letter, as a, a church that's struggling to, to know how to live for God and to, uh, to follow him and obey him. There's lots of issues in the church because they're a young church. So they're uh, they're needing a lot of instruction from Paul. But something that's really interesting about the church at Corinth is that, uh, well, the, the city of Corinth, which is in, in Greece, has taken on many forms throughout history. It's been, uh, it's been destroyed and rebuilt throughout history. And so Paul's writing to uh, not modern Corinth, but to the, the ancient church, the ancient uh, city of Corinth, the, the Christians there. But particularly interesting is the culture that they live in is a culture around them that is all about having many, many gods and many different beliefs and many different ideas. They had very different ideas about ethics and sexuality than what the church held to. It was a, a, a very busying, busy and happening city, a popular city. There was lots of uh, trade and commerce going on in the city of Corinth, so it was a popular place to go to and live and uh, to be a, a business minded person. It was, a, it was a good move to go there. And modern scholars have, have written about Corinth and said that it, it, should, it reminds them in some ways of a, of a Los Angeles of the ancient world or a, even sometimes a Los Angeles of the ancient world. So you can imagine this church planted in a city that is so different from Christianity. Uh, after all different things, not what, what, the, what the scriptures are proclaiming. And as I'm, as I'm studying this and I'm, I'm reading about Corinth, I start to think, this is just like us today. The church existing in a culture that is so far from Christianity. Got such different ideas about sexuality and ethics and even to the idea of having many different gods. That's our society right now. People are invested in all sorts of things other than the true and living God of history, of, of creation, of, of all things. So while we're reading something today and hearing of of an ancient time, it's every bit relevant for us today in our modern world. The, the people that Paul is writing to at Corinth, um, it's, it's like he's writing it to us today as well. 
It's like it's, it's every bit relevant. And this is a, a great thing about the Word of God. The Word of God is living and active. It, it is not something that is an ancient book, but it is living and speaks to every single person on the planet about every situation that we might find ourselves in in life. So this was, a, it was an attractive place. There was the rich, the poor, the Jew and the Gentile or the Greek. Whenever you read in the Bible and you see the word Gentile, just think non-Jew. Or if you read Greek, just go, that's a non-Jewish. So the, the message of salvation, God's people first is Israel, the Jew. And then the message of the gospel goes out from the Jew to the non-Jew. This is a message then for all people. And this is very much what Corinth was. It was made up of, of Jews and also non-Jewish people and just people of a, a wide variety of backgrounds and previous beliefs as well. So hopefully this gives you a bit of a picture of the people that, write, that, that Paul is writing to. Very, very different culture than what the Christians are, are, are teaching. What Paul's teaching to the church is not what the people around them are living by. So similar to us today. And you could imagine what the church was like then, just having this really hip and happening city. You know, just a, a, it was a culturally savvy, it was, this is where you went. Imagine the pressure that was on the church to change the message. Imagine the pressure that was on the church to maybe make it more modern for the Corinthian times. You could imagine the, the pressure that they felt to, well, we've got this, you know, this is decades old now, this Jesus going to the cross story. Maybe we need to update it a little bit. Does that sound a bit like the modern church as well? No different, right? Every age has Christians in the same position where they have to reconsider and say, are we going to preach this age-old message of Jesus on a cross or are we just going to update it a little bit? Maybe we just focus on some different parts of this story that maybe will make it more attractive to these, these really intelligent businessmen that we've got around us. Or we'll change it more and we'll drop our standards for those who don't agree with our stance on sexuality. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll soften those parts of this. You could imagine the pressure. And so here is Paul writing to them. And in the, the opening chapter, he says, preach the rugged old cross. Preach the message of the cross that they think is foolish. That's, that's what he's doing right here. Stay the course, preach the gospel. And so he's bringing the message of the cross again to the Corinthian church of great importance. He's not offering a new approach. And I, I just think about so many books that come out today, so many podcasts and just things that are available to us that, that almost come to us as though, hey, the world's really different than the time of the Bible. Let's, let's think about how we bring the gospel to the world today. And sure, that has a place. You know, when we start a conversation off, we want to understand where people are at. And we would see Paul doing some level of that when he speaks to Jews. He uses the Old Testament because they know it. But he never changes the message. He never leaves parts out. He never softens it. He never adjusts the message. He just says to preach this gospel because this message is the one that has brought us salvation and this message is the same one that will bring anybody salvation now and into the future as well. He says the message, uh, he says, sorry, the, um, the word of the cross is folly. It is folly to those who are perishing. That's really important for us today. So if you think firstly, and you think about Jesus on a cross, and all these Christians, they're just always on about this Jesus guy on a cross. And you just think that is just foolishness. Paul very, very bluntly says here, this is the thoughts of those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, he says, this is the power of God. That's a big statement to come out with. So one person receives it and says, foolishness. Another person, the power of God. Massive difference in what is going on here. So Good Friday, the day that we come together to remember the cross, to remember the death of Jesus, is a message that to many is foolish and to others the power 
of God for salvation. What is this Jesus going to the cross? Well, let's just revisit the narrative. All of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, contain a narrative of the death of Jesus. And they have to contain this because this was the message that we heard from Isaiah 53. This is the message from the Old Testament that one would come and he would be crushed for our iniquities. So when we read the gospel accounts, we're always going to read about the death and then the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 27? Matthew chapter 27. We're going to go from verse 45 of Matthew 27, but I want to make a couple of comments before we read this. Where we're jumping into at Matthew 27, Jesus has already been condemned to the cross. Jesus has lived a perfect, sinless life. He has done the greatest miracles, and he has been then condemned, however, by the religious elites of the time. The point where we're jumping into, Jesus has already had a crowd of people yelling, crucify him. They would not settle until he was condemned and sent to the cross. Where we're jumping into the story, he has already had the nails driven through his hands and his feet. He has been beaten. He has been mocked. He has been stripped naked and he has been lifted up publicly before the crowds. Reading from verse 45, it says, Now the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Darkness came upon the land as Jesus was at the cross. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling for Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. The mocking continues. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Verse 51, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split. There was a physical reaction upon the earth when Jesus died at the cross. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Verse 54, now watch this non-Christian bystander, the centurion, watch his words as he sees this taking place. Verse 54, when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. He could not deny as he stood before Jesus at the cross, experiencing what was going uh, on in this place and he was changed in that moment to believe in Jesus, that truly this was the Son of God. This is where we land on Good Friday, the death of Jesus, the world-changing event of the cross of Christ. Now, I'm not going to jump ahead to, to Easter Sunday, to the resurrection. We know that there is good news coming, but today is the cross. And we have to ask, why did this take place? Why did Jesus, who took on human flesh, the God-man, Christ Jesus, why did he allow people to beat him? Why did he allow them to tear the beard from his face? Why did he allow them to, to hang him up on that cross when he could have stopped it at any moment? He fulfilled the prophecy that he was crushed for our iniquity. The gospel is the good news that Jesus died for your sins. That's why it's called Good Friday. 
This whole Easter parade that we have every year that comes through of, of looking at the shops and seeing this Easter time and having these days holiday is based on the event that Jesus went to a, a cross for the sins of his people. This is why we are gathered. This is why we are saying that it is a good day. Because although it was not good what Jesus experienced, he has brought life to those who believe. To those who would see this message and not say, that's foolish, but that they would realize just like this centurion that this truly is the Son of God to them. This message becomes the power of God for their own salvation. Jesus crucified for others. Crucified for the forgiveness of sins. See, we know, and when we're honest, we know that we have all broken God's laws. Every single one of us. Now, you might have the ability, I'm sure, and you have the ability to be very nice people for a lot of the time. You have the ability to do nice things and good things in this world, but all of us are lawbreakers when it comes to our God, to our Creator. We all, like sheep, have gone astray to the greatest problem that humanity has. And you, you might be in this place at the moment where you watch the news and you go, why is our world so crazy? The greatest problem is the problem of sin that every single human being has. That God has made a people and a people have gone astray. That God is good and gives good things to his people, but people have desired to be like God, desired to have uh, greater things or, or things that they thought were greater than God's blessings, to go on and chase after their own life rather than come to the one who created them and to learn humbly from him. So we are all lawbreakers. The death of Jesus was a substitutionary death, which means that it should be us going through the punishment for our sins. It should be human beings uh, have to pay for their sins. Just like when you consider a criminal who stands before a judge, and you would think that in, in, in any case, a criminal standing before a judge, it is good and it is right for justice to take place. You wouldn't think that it would be good for a murderer to get off. You wouldn't think that it would be good for a criminal who has stolen your belongings to just be able to go on without any form of justice taking place. Nobody questions that when it comes to a, a human court of law, but they question it when they consider their own law breaking against a holy and a righteous God. And this is the predicament that every single human being is in, that all of us are going to stand before our maker. We are all going to stand before God and give an account for our lives. And the, the crazy, scary thing is that people of this world are hoping that they did good enough to override the bad. They're hoping that the couple of good deeds that they've done along the way are going to outweigh breaking God's laws. This is not the case. Yet here comes the message of the cross that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have their sins forgiven. That yes, they will stand before holy and righteous God, but Jesus has taken the penalty at the cross for all those who believe. And so what Paul brings out here today is two responses. Those who would say they hear this, and even after hearing about what Jesus has done, would still say, that's foolish. Even after having this message proclaimed to them that you can have life in Christ, have them still say foolishness. Yet on the other hand, to be one who believes is to have the life given to them right now. Even this day, if that's you and you're considering, am I somebody who thinks this message is a load of nonsense? Or am I hearing this today and saying, no, I, I think this is for me. I want this to be for me as well. Then there's good, good news for you today. So as we proceed, just keep in mind here that Paul never gets away from this message being awkward. And maybe you feel a little bit awkward when you hear this message at times, like maybe you were considering telling it to your neighbor. You know, like there's somebody who you love in life or a family member, and you think, yeah, but the message itself, it's a bit awkward. Like, how do I go from how's the weather to, do you know about this guy who died for your sins? 
Paul makes no excuses for the awkwardness of the message. And not once does he ever say, let's reword it a little bit to take the edge off a little bit. So here in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians, he says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. This is a quote straight from the book of Isaiah once again. God speaking through the prophet how he will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And the discernment of the discerning, that person who by the world's standards is a, is a discerning person. They're a wise person. People of the earth would look up to this person and say, yes, that person is very, very wise by human standards. God says that he will destroy this wisdom. He will thwart this discernment. This reminds us of Psalm 2, which says that the nations are raging against God, aren't they? Kings are raging against God. Do they, do they look, when, when politicians decide to uh, look at laws, do they grab the Bible and consider, well, what has God got to say on the matter? Not at all. They are, they are seeking their own wisdom, their own discernment, their own knowledge, leaving God's out completely. But here, God laughs at their foolishness. We see here in this very chapter how God feels about the, the wise and the discerning of this age. The world trusts the experts, and the experts regularly lead people astray, don't they? Did you see that through COVID? Did we all look to the experts of the world during the COVID season? Foolishness. The foolishness of man. See, God says of such wisdom that he will destroy it. Paul is talking and quoting here he's, uh, about the people of the world who have these, these wise words, or even the ones, and this is what the Greeks love. The Greeks love the person who could stand and give an eloquent speech. Reminds me of a modern-day TED Talk. Very snazzy, very, very on point with the day, very, very forward-thinking and, and dynamic in the, in the speaking and the delivery. This is what the Greeks love. They'd come out for such a show. And that's what it was. It was a show to be impressed by the wisdom and the knowledge of man, and God will destroy it. So the question then Paul asks is, he knows that they're out there. He knows that there's the religious leader of the day, the scribes and the Pharisees. He knows that there's the, the philosopher of the day. And he says in verse 20, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the de debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Calling out the elites of the day. Ones who were considered to be wise in, in, in their days. Paul says that God has made their wisdom as foolishness. And instead, he brings salvation to souls, let's be honest, through what many consider to be the most embarrassing message. The foolishness of the cross is the very thing that God uses to bring life to a soul. See, if you consider crucifixion for a moment and what it was historically, it was the most embarrassing death you could have. You talk, you know, hear things of a, of a soldier talking about, a, I had a good death. It was a, a, a good death that, that, that came to somebody. A crucifixion was not a good death. It was humiliating and embarrassing. You were publicly naked before people. You were beaten and mocked, and you were hanging up there publicly that people might see what was going on. It wasn't something private that happened with just a few close family members when we consider something like a, a modern-day lethal injection. Now, this was a public event. Bring, bring your family and your mates to come along and have a look at this spectacle. What a fool this person must be to, to have landed and had crucifixion as the way that they are going to finish their life. It was disgusting it was the most ridiculous for a person to go through, the most embarrassing for a person to have to go through. And yet this foolishness is the very event that God splits the timeline in two with. The very event is the reason that you're here today. The, that very ridiculous event is the reason why you are going to have life with Christ for all of eternity. God takes that which is foolish in the eyes of the world and he uses it 
for greater purposes. We know he does that with people. He uses the foolish preacher. He uses the foolish person and brings life to those who need the forgiveness of sins. So here Paul is calling them out and and contrasting this, this message that the world considers so foolish with the wise of the day. God uses this hideous crucifixion, however, to bring salvation. Notice what God doesn't do. God doesn't try and outdo the wisdom of the world by bringing something else that the world's going to go, okay, now that's even more wise. God doesn't come to the, to the Stephen Hawking of the day or the Richard Dawkins and, uh, from, the, from the temple of science and, and start getting a better debate than what they have. So remember that when you consider the, all of the things that you have today to believe in. You've got so many different views and beliefs out there and some of them might seem so wise to you. God is not updating his message. He gets his people once again to come with the foolishness of the cross and preach it. And what happens, souls are saved as a result of it. Let that be a comfort to you today. This message was foolish 2,000 years ago. The message is foolish today. But it is the power of God for salvation for those who believe. In the modern church setting, there's often a a big focus that people will have on leaving out this message. Leaving out the discussion of sin because it's just a bit uncomfortable, isn't it? Now, was Jesus a compassionate person? Absolutely. But it's easy just to focus on Jesus being a compassionate person and preaching that to people. That's a much easier message. I could could spend 20 minutes, half an hour this morning just talking about, hey, Jesus was just really compassionate. Jesus was just a really nice guy and it'd be great if he got to know him. That's what a lot of places are doing right now. This sin stuff, this cross stuff, it's a bit embarrassing, but everybody loves a kind guy, don't they? Let's just preach that. It's not what Paul's saying to do here. Stick to the cross. Stick to the preaching of the cross. And God is going to use it, and he is using it, making the wisdom of the world foolish. See, the Jews were waiting for their political leader that would conquer with sword, yet the one God sends dies on a cross for the forgiveness of his people. What is this foolishness, a person asks. God turns the wisdom of the world upside down with this very message. An all-powerful God who takes on human flesh and dies a death that you deserve, that I deserve, He says in verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. So here we land on these two categories this morning of those who are being saved and those who are perishing. So to the Christian person in the room here, you hear this phrase, those who are being saved. Maybe you've got a question about that. Maybe you say, hang on, I've believed in Jesus' death and resurrection, so aren't I saved now? Yes, you are. Amen to that. But we live in a reality of the now and yet to come. The now and the not yet. There There is more to come. Your day of salvation was not the final end of the story. There is the day where you are glorified with Christ. So we are saved now in the present, by believing upon Christ, his death and his resurrection, turning from our sins. We are saved now, but we are being saved in the process because we have more to come. We are going to be glorified with Christ. And this is the message that I want for every single person in this room today. Not to be the other category of person, those who are perishing. Because the end of that is is, is horrific. And, And what sort of people would we be If we withheld the information about the end of perishing from you, what sort of people would we be if we didn't care about your soul in such a way that we would say, the place that you will go to, I have to warn you of this. Jesus describes 
what will happen to those who die in their sins and remain perishing. He says that they were, they're going to go on to continue perishing for an eternity. This state of perishing is a state of torment forever. It does not end. To be removed from the love of God in this life and have an eternal state of perishing is to go to the place that Jesus described as the outer darkness, a place with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, Christians know this information because they've got Bibles that reveal to us this information about those who are perishing. So we must preach the message of the cross regardless of how foolish someone might think you are. Because we do not want people to go to a place that Jesus describes as an outer darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. A place that's described as a lake of fire. What sort of people would we be to withhold such information? That's not a loving person. To just say to somebody instead, hey, just try and be nice. To say, try and soften the message and just say to people, look, just maybe consider Jesus. No, but to warn you, to lovingly warn you as a, as a friend, to say, believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. He is your only hope. He is the only hope for humanity. There are those who are perishing who think this is just absolutely foolishness. But then there are those who believe and are saved. Those who have, and this is not just, we have to be very careful, we don't just think about this as a ticket to heaven. That the cross wasn't just simply so that I got my foot in the door and one day I don't have to worry too much about hell because I'm pretty sure I said a prayer once. No, the, the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ changes lives. It transforms people's heart from the innermost being to becoming a new creation in Christ. Your whole life changes. Your entire life changes as you come to Christ. Paul says in verse 22 that Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. And you will meet people today who demand signs. And maybe, maybe you're hearing this message today and say, well, look, I hear what you're saying, but I want some proof, thank you very much. Proof's not going to make you believe. People in Jesus' day had him right in front of them, performing miracles. They had him right there, raising the dead, and they still didn't believe. People demand signs. And also, just think for a moment, as we think of somebody who would be a, a human being demanding signs from God. It's quite bold, isn't it? It's like a child who starts demanding things from their parents. You know, a small child comes into the kitchen, starts stomping their foot, telling the parents what they should give them, what they ought to do. That child is told very, very quickly, parents, stop looking at your children. None of our kids would do that. Yet here we are, as little children, stomping our feet demanding signs from God. God has given all that we need. Romans 1, through all that has been created, God has given you every single thing that you need. That's why you can't escape him, because he is everywhere. Because the minute you look at the sky, you were given information into your very being about a God who is a creator. But the thing that we do with the information, as Romans teaches us, is we suppress that truth about God. Yet when we hear the message of the cross and we believe in Jesus he opens our eyes to become a new creation in him. There are people who seek wisdom of the day, like the Greeks were seeking wisdom, but the wisdom of the cross is the power that will save. Verse 23 says, But we preach Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. It's a stumbling block to the Jew because they wanted the political leader, right? They wanted the leader with sword in hand. So this message of a, of a saviour dying on a cross is a stumbling block to them. And it's, it's foolishness to the Gentile because they want someone to outwise the next wise person. They want the, the more eloquent speaker that would come through. The Jew stumbles because this isn't the Messiah that they were expecting. 
But to those, and this is verse 24, those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So to those who God is calling to himself and perhaps he's calling you today and you, you sense that, you understand that, you, 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 you realise that that's taking place even hearing the preaching of the cross today. From out of the world, the Jew and the non-Jewish person, the message concerning the cross is the wisdom that you need to hear today. Even though it might seem weak and foolishness in, in the sense that the, a, a God who is all-powerful might do this act that seems so weak, even it, compared with the strength of humanity, outshines, it is, is, is far greater, far stronger than, the, than anything that mankind would have to offer. The foolishness of God is infinitely greater than the greatest human thinker. The weakness of God is infinitely more powerful than the greatest army of mankind that one could assemble. So let me apply this in just a couple of points. Number one, Christian, today, Good Friday, rejoice in the foolishness of the cross. Come again to the message, the ancient message of the cross. It is the power of God for your salvation. Relax. You don't need to change it. You don't need to soften it. You don't need to try and make it less awkward. It is the world that has the awkwardness of not believing in God. The reality that his signs and his presence is everywhere, yet they seek their own wisdom. That's awkward. Don't feel like you need to change the message for your family and friends. We love people and we tell them the ancient message. Number two, to the wise of the day, to the, to the one who is well read, to the lofty in speech or to the one who, who would consider themselves physically strong. You can have all of that. You can have all wisdom. You can be well read in philosophy, in science, in everything of the day and you can still spend an eternity in hell, in the lake of fire. But what we do have for you today is the message of the cross that will bring you salvation. The reality that you would come to know that you are a sinner, that I'm a sinner, that we are all sinners. We have all sinned against God. We've all broken his laws. And you might say, I don't know if I have broken his laws. Well, let me just glance over a few of God's commandments for a moment that would tell us we've all stolen. We have all lied. We have all lusted. We have all been jealous and envious of another. We have all gossiped and hated in our heart. And I've only just made it through a handful of the commandments. It doesn't take very long when faced with the reality of God's laws to recognize, yes, I have sinned against God. That is a reality that each one needs to face. I'm a lawbreaker and I deserve to be punished for my breaking of laws. But the good news that I bring to you today is the message that we heard at the start of the service from Isaiah 53, which was that Jesus was crushed for those sins that you thought of. Jesus has bore our iniquities in his own body, taken the sins of humanity upon himself. He entered into our reality having never sinned, but willingly went to the cross that you might have life. So if you hear this message today, if you're, if you're hearing this and, and it's, it's in your heart right now, you know that this is for you. There is a simple response that you can bring today. Respond to God by repenting of your sin and believing in Jesus. That's all it is. You don't need a priest and a confession booth to go and go through all the things that you have done. You do not need to go out from this service and find every person that you've hurt and try and make it right so that God will accept you. You don't need to try and labor in your time in such a way that God will then go, I can see you getting good now. No, you believe upon Jesus. We admit that we are sinners and we believe upon Jesus. There is no other name by which men are saved. And finally, as we, as we do this then today, I want to invite you to life in Christ, to know him, 
to know the fellowship of the saints and to have your sins forgiven. Let's pray together.